So up until now, we've been talking about protein structure prediction and using AlphaFold, and now we're going to talk about protein sequence design. Um, and specifically, we'll do a demonstration on protein MPNN after we talk about it. OK, so what is protein sequence design? Um, well, it sounds like what it is, which is our goal is to now figure out what other types of changes we can make to the sequence but still have um, possibly the same structure. So we talked about going from a single sequence into its full 3D conformation. So this is structure prediction. Um, and we also talked about different types of representation for proteins in machine learning. And so we talked about uh, our sequence being in one hot encoding representation. We talked about evolutionary information in terms of alignment and evolutionary signal. Uh, we talked about secondary structure, uh, all sorts of inter-residue distances, torsion angles, other types of angles, protein surfaces, um, coordinates in general, and also constructing some type of protein graph. Um, and so now we're interested in going from a given backbone. So we're given all of the backbone coordinates, and we're going to design a protein sequence onto this fixed backbone. So this problem um, in general is called fixed backbone design uh, because your goal isn't to make changes to the backbone itself, but it's to find new sequences. So maybe some diversity in the types of sequences that end up folding into the same structure. And so before we get started with protein MPNN specifically, we're going to talk about the MPNN architecture that was built by John Ingram. Um, so in NeurIPS 2019, uh, which is a conference, John Ingram and others uh, presented an MPNN architecture. So MPNN stands for Message, Pass in Neur Message Passing Neural Network. Um, and so in this case, what we have, uh, this is a figure taken from their paper. Um, we have uh, some information at the level of structure that we encode so that we can figure out what exact sequence identity at each position. Um, so this black squiggle here um, is some cartoon for the protein backbone. And at each node, we're going to have a residue. And so you can think of this as the nodes and edges that we discussed earlier in the day. Um, and so given this structural information where we know um, exactly the coordinates that define every single one of these nodes, our goal is to figure out what amino acid identity should be at each of these uh, node indices. And so um, in terms of the information flow, our starting point um, are essentially nodes that do not have an amino acid uh, sort of identity predicted yet. Uh, so we're going to start with the positions and this entire backbone with distances and other types of features that we'll talk about. And the information flows from structure whenever our goal is to predict this identity right here. Um, and as we start predicting, let's say we're going from the N terminal all the way to the C terminal here then we're going to predict um, in order. And once we get to predicting this specific ith residue, we see that not only can we use the structural information um, of this neighborhood, but we can also use the sequence and structural information um, of our previous prediction. So whatever position we previously predicted will inform what we end up designing for this ith position. Um, so going from this backbone and figuring out the positions, uh, so the residue identity here, um, until the entire backbone is uh, sort of identified or predicted some type of sequence for, um, is we're going to call that autoregressive. So the prediction um, is autoregressive in that you're starting and you're trying to fill in every single one of these blanks in order. And so that order influences your prediction at each position because um, you can start using the sequence information in the neighborhood as well as structure. Um, and so in terms of the type of architecture and what layers make an MPNN, um, if we just look at this, our structure graph here is going to be the inputs and our sequence is going to be the output. So we're interested in predicting sequences and comparing them to the ground truth. 
um, and our input that tells us what sequence is feasible to be at each position is the entire protein graph. Um, and so we're going to have the nodes that we described and the edges we describe, um, as well as some other types of edge features. And based on these, we're going to encode all of the node information and have some updates at the level of edges and eventually figure out how to decode um, for each of these positions the correct sequence identity. And the loss that's associated with this um, MPNN is going to be uh, cross entropy. So every time you predict the sequence, um, position wise, you will calculate some type of loss. So how far off is it from the ground truth sequence? Um, and then the idea is to sort of strengthen all of these uh, weights that associate, that are associated with um, encoding and decoding. So the more accurate you can get at encoding this graph, the more accurate you can get at decoding from that graph onto the sequence. Um, you keep improving this until it starts looking exactly like the correct ground truth sequence. And uh, I want to talk about the edge features specifically. So yesterday, um, you learned about a few different strategies uh, for describing and learning in terms of neighborhoods. So in proteins, this is also possible. Uh, we very briefly discussed it today. So you could define, for example, a 30 node neighborhood. So for one neighborhood that, let's go back. So let's say I'm interested in predicting the residue, the residue type here then this neighborhood, so maybe 30 nodes around it, will be the most influential in terms of what identity could possibly be accommodated at that position. Um, and so neighborhood size is something that you've experimented with until now. Um, and so in proteins, you can also think for this residue scale graph, the neighborhood is going to have um, a lot to do with this influence and also that we want to stop at a point um, where it's still computationally efficient in terms of the neighborhood size but it still gives us the answer that we want. So you don't want to compromise from accuracy, but it is also important to keep things quite efficient while still remaining effective. And so we're going to have some type of neighborhood size and going from our distances, which are going to make up our features, we're going to have some sparsity to this by describing a neighborhood. And that's going to allow us to have sharper peaks where it matters. So for closer nodes, it's going to be more important to consider exactly what it is that flows from these nodes. So uh, for the ones that are very, very close, if they have some sequence identity filled in, it will be very informative because we know that some of these residues are going to be bulky, for example. And so we know that a lot of bulky residues can't be in a very compact neighborhood together. Uh, and so these types of patterns are going to be useful in making that prediction more accurate. And also there's going to be something called orientations. So orientations refer to essentially which direction uh, you, you have to go between two different, uh, let's say, alpha carbons. So if you course into the label, if you course into the level of alpha carbons and your goal is to figure out uh, sort of what kind of relationship in terms of their geometry uh, can be useful for you to make these, this type of prediction, then you would have to calculate some, what we're gonna call point cloud and the frames, which are the orientations associated with this. Um, and all of this information you can construct given a protein backbone. And to quickly go over their results. So in this case, they compare at the time to Rosetta fixed backbone design protocol. We didn't specifically go over this, so we didn't do a demo on this, but uh, at the time it was popular for protein sequence design and, and they wanted to compare their method at a certain temperature value of 0 0.1 and we'll really talk about temperature and depth in our practice, but let's compare uh, something called recovery. So what do you think this recovery means in terms of protein sequences? So this is the measure for accuracy but what are you exactly recovering? Okay, so you're recovering native sequence, maybe having Let's say that all of the blue positions are exactly identical to this ground truth sequence and this is your prediction and this green region is the only incorrect 
let's say, segment of predictions here. So your percentage would be defined by how much of it you got exactly the same as the ground truth. And so if it was alanine at position, let's say, 100, and you got valine, that would be incorrect. And so your recovery would decrease. If it was 100%, then you would have exactly the same sequence. Um, and if you, let's say, have some diversity where, um, let's just say you're able to design slightly similar um, sequences, but they're different in terms of exact identity. Maybe they conserve some type of chemical propensity. Maybe it's hydrophobic in similar regions. Um, so overall, you're making diverse sequences, but recovery uh, is a metric of exactly how what percent is fully identical. So it's not sequence similarity. It's sequence identity to the ground truth sequence. Uh, so in this case, getting 27.6% over 17.9% is good, so they were able to improve upon Rosetta Fixed Backbone Protocol. So compared to that on a benchmark of 103 proteins, they were able to do quite well, um, at least for this time, so when this was published. And what, you, what do you notice about this speed? So this is, you learn about CPUs versus GPUs. So if you look at speed for designing an amino acid per second, for CPU versus GPU time, what do you observe? Okay, so it was a lot faster. And then what do you observe in GPUs? Right, so that's something that we talked about earlier today. Um, but essentially they were doing quite a bit better. They were also doing this in quite a bit less time. Uh, and when compared to on a specific benchmark of 40 proteins, it was also incredibly significant um, in terms of how far it can get. But also, this is not that many proteins. Um, neither is this. So the test set from this paper has a lot more proteins than 103. Um, but perhaps it was difficult to run Rosetta with the speed. Um, and so let's just consider this number and take a look at protein MPNN specifically. So protein MPNN came out last summer. Uh, and once again, we're going from protein backbone coordinates. So this is our backbone of interest to protein sequence. And we're building on top of the architecture from John Ingram. And so this work is from Eustace uh, and others from David Baker's lab. And so what we're looking at here is the first figure from protein MPNN paper. Um, and so let's start over here. So we have protein backbone of interest and it's going to have 3D coordinates. Let's talk about the heavy coordinates specifically. So heavy atom coordinates being nitrogen, alpha carbon, carbonyl carbon, oxygen, and beta carbon. So based on these distances, we can construct edges we talked about this. Um, we're also going to try to predict the sequence based on updates to the nodes here. So you're starting with zeros, essentially. And then to explain the color code a little bit, um, so in here, chain A is represented in red and chain B is in green. So this is a multi-chain protein sequence design model. So it's capable of designing sequences onto either just a monomeric input or some type of multimeric input and they colored these in terms of the edges that are fed into the model as well as the nodes and then the sequence prediction. So based on that what we see is okay so into the backbone encoder we have to give some edges and nodes and based on the uh, edges and the features that are learnable, learnable we are going to update the nodes and you, or you're also going to have various updates um, in here there are three MLP layers, so you're learning at the level of nodes, and then you're going to update your edges. Um, and based on this entire scheme, you go into the decoder, which has a similar architecture. Um, and let's just ignore this for a second. So your goal is to update the nodes until it basically is filled in for the entire entirety of this backbone, so the length. And then essentially you end up at probabilities, so you're going to have a probability um, per position of the 20 amino acid identities. And based on that, you're going to end up sampling um, all sorts of sequences. So this is the full rundown. 
And in terms of protein and PNN being autoregressive, we're going to talk about the random decoding order and the iterative decoding that takes place right there. So let's take a look at a decoding scheme. So when we have left to right decoding, which we talked about very briefly here, what does that mean in terms of uh, termini of proteins? So you have left to right decoding. What is left? So you're going from N terminus to C terminus. And then let's take a look at the other um, idea here. So in their idea, they're going to decode randomly. And so the random decoding order is that you don't follow this one, two, three, four, five going from the N terminal to the C terminal, but you sort of fill it in in a random order. And that ends up having some implications um, as to how you can get it to be more accurate in sequence recovery. Um, and also something that they do for homo uh, oligomers, so for homo oligomeric proteins, um, and here, how many chains are there? So this is uh, essentially a trimer, and the, the thought here is that you can have tied chain decoding. So at each position that you're currently decoding, so whatever random position you're currently decoding, you end up matching chain A, B, and C so that they have the same exact identity because you know that this is going to be a monomer. So the positions would have to match in terms of the sequence identity. And this allows you to sort of uh, collect more structural information from all of them at once at this symmetric assembly and then make a more, I guess, better predicted um, sequence identity. Um, better predict the sequence identity at each of these positions. And you do this until the entire protein backbone is filled out in terms of sequence. Uh, and so this is over here with the iterative decoding and random decoding order plus the sampling from the probabilities is an inference diagram. So this is what you do in inference. And we're going to see how we can influence the sampling process and what it looks like for oligomeric assemblies in general. So let's talk about some of the results we see from the protein MPNN paper. Um, and this is a table of performance breakdown. And um, how do we measure performance for this once again? Recovery. So the goal is to recover as accurately as you can. So get as close to being this entirely blue sequence, much like the ground truth, as we can. Uh, and so let's take a look at uh, breakdown for single chain. So single chain, we're looking at monomers here in this table, um, and we're going to consider this unbolded uh, zero noise level case for right now, and then I'll explain what this is. Uh, so let's take a look at the baseline model. So this baseline model is essentially very close to setup to John Ingram's model. Um, and what they're doing is they're looking at, they're reporting the number of parameters, they're looking at the test accuracy on their chosen PDBs that are single chain, as well as something called perplexity, which we're going to cover in detail tomorrow, um, as well as AlphaFold model accuracy. So let's pause here for a second. What do you think AlphaFold model accuracy means? We predict a bunch of sequences, and we feed them through AlphaFold and see how accurate this predicted structure is to the ground truth. And then we report that as well as recovery in this table right here. So in the baseline model, we get around 41.2% test accuracy. And then let's take a look at experiment one. So at this point, they start adding uh, different uh, either features or they change certain things about the decoding order and they call these different types of experiments and see how much they improve in terms of accuracy, uh, either for the overall recovery or alpha fold model accuracy. So for experiment two, for experiment one, what they do is they add nitrogen, alpha carbon, carbonyl carbon, beta carbon, and oxygen distances. Uh, and so in the beginning, having more distances to learn from allows you to figure out sort of more of this structural information flow. And so when you're starting from nothing and none of these 
amino acid identities are known, all you have in terms of information flow is structure. So having or sort of having a better hold on structural detail will allow you to recover a lot more in terms of sequence identity. And in here we see that there is quite a nice increase from this previous baseline model. So let's take a look at experiment two. In this case, they're going to update the encoder edges. So if you go back in the encoder, they're going to have some update to the edges. And this is going to change how well you can learn uh, between your all of your node and edge features and the other patterns that they gather. Uh, so from PDB test accuracy of experiment one to experiment two, we see that, well, maybe if we combine these, because they both do better than baseline, we're going to get something higher, and that's exactly what happens in experiment three. In experiment four, all they change is they make the ran uh, they make the decoding order random instead of left to right. So this is the final experiment, and with that, they end on fifty point eight percent accuracy on the test set, and for alpha fold model accuracy, it's forty six point nine. And so. That is quite impressive, especially compared to what it was right before this when we took a look at this table. So compared to this Rosetta Fixed Backbone protocol, you can see quite a huge increase in our ability to recover sequences. Um, and of course, there is a caveat to acknowledge that this was this is currently comparing 103 proteins. So to go into more detail of the performance, let's take a look at uh, sequence recovery here as shown on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have something called average beta carbon distance for eight closest neighbors. Uh, so let's, let's try to dissect what this means. So you have beta carbon distance for eight closest neighbors. So, um, Maybe let's ask it this way. What does it mean to have your eight closest beta carbons in terms of your neighbor be very, very close? So maybe some distinction as to secondary structure. What else? So if we look at an actual protein structure, let's just take a look at this one right here. Where do you think you have your eight closest beta carbons really, really close together? Okay, so I'm hearing the center of the protein. What is the center of the protein called? The core? Do you think you have your eight closest beta carbons really close at the surface? Okay, so then if we go back and look at this, once again, what is it a measure of? Surface versus core. So some type of burial. So a metric of burial. And so let's say you're on this end over here. Is it core or surface? And if you're over here, okay, so we're going from core residues to surface residues, and we're taking a look at sequence recovery at that. So in terms of burial, we try to analyze what happens to our ability to recover the native sequence. And is it better to have a high or a low sequence recovery? So is this good and this is bad? Is this always necessarily bad? No, why not? So is it possible that there is no ground truth if you're starting from a brand new backbone? Maybe it doesn't look like anything. Or maybe you're trying to have some de novo function and there isn't necessarily some sequence to recover. It's just you're trying to design a realistic sequence onto a backbone. And so that could happen. So for this case, uh, we'll just take a look at this, and we know that 100% sequence recovery would mean you have exactly the ground truth sequence. Um, and we're looking at what happens with burial. So what do you observe? Either for Rosetta, which is in blue, or for a protein MB MPNN in orange. So if you just look at the pattern for both of them, what's the trend? So why is it hard to predict the right sequence the further it gets away from the core? So there's more flexibility, what else? Okay, so there isn't enough physical constraint on the surface for you to be able to identify, so there are more options, and so it's harder to recover the exact same sequence. And so 
the core residues are a lot more restricted, physically speaking, and that also has uh, some influence on what identity is possible to go there. And also, what do we have on the right here? So what does this show? We have monomers and homomers and heteromers. So we're plotting sequence recovery for different types of input. So for monomers, you can assume that, let's say only chain A goes into protein MPNN and we only get sequences for chain A. And then for these, we want multimeric sequence. So we want sequence prediction for multiple chains at once. And they're comparing the accuracy when run with monomeric uh, proteins from the test set versus this one versus that one. And which one is the most accurate? 